भगवते so a reading from Canto 11, Chapter 7, entitled Lord Krishna Instructs Uddhava. And this is text number 8. Pumsam yuktasya nanartaho Pumsa yuktasya nanartaho Brahma saguna dosya bahak Brahma saguna dosya bahak Karma karma vikarmeti Guna dosa dio bida Pumsa yuktasya nanartaho Brahma saguna dosya bhak Karma 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 meti Guna dosa dio bida Umsam yuktasya narnartaho Brahma saguna dosya bhak Karma karma vikar meti Guna dosya diho bida Ladies, mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Pums, hey, please go ahead. Pumsa of a person. A yuktasya, whose mind is diverted from the truth. Nana, many. Artha, values or meanings. Brahma, confusion. Sa, that. Guna, something good. Dosha, something bad. Bhak, Embodying karma, 
compulsory duties, a karma, non-performance of prescribed duties, vikarma, forbidden activities, et, thus, guna, good things, dosa, bad things, dia, of one who perceives, bida, this difference. Hmm. So these are instructions by Lord Krishna to Uddhava. So this is sometimes called, it is called the Uddhava Gita. As Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, he took the same knowledge and brought it to a higher level of understanding and philosophical teachings in the 11th canto to Sri Uddhava. So this is Krishna's words. One whose consciousness is bewildered by illusion, illusion, one whose consciousness is bewildered by illusion perceives many differences in value and meaning among material objects. We'll read that again. One whose consciousness is bewildered by illusion perceives many differences in value and meaning among material objects. Thus, one engages constantly on the platform of material good and evil and is bound up by such conceptions. Absorbed in material duality, such persons contemplate the performance of compulsory duties, non-performance of such duties, and performance of forbidden activities. The purport is approximately four pages long. <coughs> so I'll read part of the purport and then maybe We'll speak a little and then continue on. <clears throat> Purpur by the, the, the servants of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The illusory mental platform of existence is described in this verse. The word Akyuktasya indicates the conditioned soul who does not fix his mind on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is clearly described in Bhagavad Gita and other Vedic literature that Lord Krishna, the absolute truth, is within everything and everything is within the Lord. The example may be given that when a woman loves a man, she is most eager to see him and she daily sees him dressed in different clothes. Actually, the woman is interested, interested not in the clothes but in the man. Similarly, with every material object is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, one who has developed love of God constantly seeing the Lord everywhere and not just the superficial material objects that cover the Lord. So I'll stop there and then we'll continue on. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Dena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stap Ditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kedam Mayam Dadati Swa Padantika Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pistaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachadine Nirisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sivasiri, Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hmm. So the verse actually will be explained later on in the purport in more detail. But here it's basically saying that there are persons who are bewildered by the idea of how to find happiness in the material world. And so, according to social and religious principles, people align themselves with things to do and things not to do, <laughs> which are based on what is good in the material sense and what is not good in the material sense. And so in the scriptures, in basic religious scriptures, that is called vidis and nishedas. Things you should do 
and things you should avoid. You know, just like, for example, eat prashadam, don't eat boga. <laughs> okay. Or um, be polite to everyone, don't be rude. That's a general, what we say, you know, aesthetic principle of how people live in the material world. Um, what's another thing? Mm, you know, um, if you want to be a good businessman, then you have to really understand how the intricacies of how to use your product in such a way that people will be attracted to buy it even if they don't need it. And this is called good business. <laughs> how to sell something that people don't need and be make a profit from that and make them think they need it. So, so thinking how to further one's material interests by using one's material intelligence in order to somehow acquiesce various types of successes in the material world. So people contemplate that. How to avoid the suffering, how to bring about happiness. And by not, they also contemplate by not doing that, then I'm not successful. So here it mentions that the contemplation or the intelligence directed towards adjusting the material energy in such a way as to further one's interest in the material world for material happiness, material success, material position, material power, material gain in some form or another. And by not doing that, then there's a chance that I won't be happy. I won't, I won't be happy. That's the conclusion they make. And there's certain things I must seriously avoid. And if I avoid these things, then, and access and emphasize the material things, then my life is happy, materially. This is the adjustment. But what does Krishna say to this? He says, this is illusion. <laughs> Krishna says, this is illusion because they perceive the material objects in, as a source of material happiness. <laughs> Material objects are simply a combination of the material energy. Bhumir apana balo bhaya kamana buddhave vacha. Ahankar itiyam me bina prakriti astada. Earth, water, fire, ether, air, mind, intelligence, and ego. Uh, and did I miss one? Sky? Yeah. Akash. Yeah, those eight elements are everything you see in this material world. There's nothing beyond that. So whatever forms you see in this world, including our material bodies and our bodies, are simply a combination of these elements. And that's all. And in some cases, even the subtle elements don't exist in some of in the more gross forms of existence, such as rocks and like that. So these, this is the whole thing. Now where is this energy coming from? It's coming from the source, and that is Krishna. Krishna says, I'm the source of everything, material and spiritual. And therefore, people see the combinations of these different energies as objects to enjoy or objects to avoid because it won't bring my happiness or enjoyment or my success in life. So Krishna calls this illusion. <laughs> And people see the same objects in different ways. <laughs> so therefore, who's right and who's not right? According to one's perception, what is per one's perception based on? One's consciousness. And what is one's consciousness formulated based on? One's desires. And how one's desires are developed according to one's activities in, the, in previous and present lives. So you take all this and you put it all together, and this is the grand illusion. <laughs> So that's why we call this world an illusionary energy, because it per it's perceived in a certain way which is completely different. <laughs> First of all, the, the basic principle, it's not enjoyable by the living entity. <laughs> Krishna says, Bhoktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram suhidam sarva bhutanam nyantamam shantam richtiti. This energy is my energy. <laughs> what is it? Maya dakshena prakriti suyate sachara charam. Hetuna nenekonti evyagat vivar vipartante. So Krishna emphasizes over and over, and also the acharyas emphasizing Krishna's statements, explain to how this material energy is working. It's only working in one way. 
by the direction of the person who brought it into existence, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And here, this is the important part in this first part of the purport. It mentions that, um, that behind the material energy is the hand of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, both directing it and actually it's simply a material form and it always changes. So the energy is not actually real because it's always changing. That's why we call it illusionary energy. But we call it an illusionary energy. Why? Because there's another reason. Because it's not, you can't enjoy it, but you think you can. You think you can control it, but you can't control it. So this is where the illusion comes. So the illusion is in two aspects. One, it's not what you perceive. And two, it's not meant for your enjoyment and control. <laughs> As soon as you try to control the material energy, what happens? You get controlled by it. <laughs> because there's a more powerful controller behind that material energy, and that's the person who created the material energy. And Krishna says it works in my direct, under my direction. So here, a nice analogy is used. Uh, this is interesting how they have found this interesting analogy that a woman she has some attraction and attachment to her husband or to a man, as is described. But she sees him in different ways, in different dresses. You know, he may go to work in a suit. He has his, you know, relaxing home outfit. He's in a bathing suit. He's in his pajamas. In other words, he may dress in different ways. But her attraction is not so much, or not maybe even here, for the external dress of the person, but for the person. So this analogy is really clear. It says that what we're attracted to in the material energy is actually the form of Krishna behind the material energy. So actually, the material energy is a manifestation of Krishna's material form, that's all, in a form of his energy which is makes up this material existence. So one who sees that behind the material energy or the person who is controlling it is actually the Supreme Personality of God. It actually sees. And it's explained that one who develops pure Krishna consciousness may see the forms of this world, but they actually see the form of Krishna within that world. In other words, they have reached pure spiritual consciousness. So a devotee knows that this material energy cannot be controlled and cannot be enjoyed. That's step one. <laughs> when we understand that, then it's easy to make progress in devotional service. It's easy to make progress in devotional service. So still, why, why do we, still, we make an effort to use the material energy, but using the material energy for the service of the Lord. So it is explained that one, no matter what one performs, if one dedicates one's activities to the service of the Lord, whatever one's position is within ashram or within social and what we say day-to-day -day life in this material world, then, then that brings one's consciousness to a higher stage of existence. And that'll be explained later in this particular verse, I mean in this pur purport. So it's about Krishna, it's not about manipulating the material energy or using the material energy in the service of the Lord. And that is perfection. Prabhupada would say there's there is those people who see the material energy as a source of misery, or they simply see the material energy as causing them uh, so many difficulties in life, and therefore they want to renounce all material activities and simply meditate, or various types of meditation, or study of the scriptures, nati, 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 not this, not that. In other words, simply to somehow or other remove themselves from the activities of the material energy through this idea of renunciation. But that is false because no one can renounce anything because it's not yours to renounce in the first place. 
And the second place is that is actually um, real renunciation means to accept ananatar saksa visayan ye yujam upayum jite nirbande krishna sambande yukta vairagya uchite. So Rupa Goswami explains that real renunciation or actual renunciation, sometimes we use the word complete renunciation, means to see everything in, the, in relationship to the Lord and use that. That's Krishna consciousness. But then there is more. And so we'll read a little bit more in the purport. The word ayuktasya in this verse indicates one who has not come to the stage of reality. That means one who does not see Krishna with everything in anything. Such a person being deprived of loving devotional service to Krishna attempts to enjoy the innumerable forms and flavors of material existence. This temporary illusionary engagement is not the constitutional function of the bewildered living entity who remains without any awareness of the ultimate reality, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Hmm. Within the world of matter, there are undoubtedly varieties. Among dogs, there are pedigree poodles and common mutts. And among horses, there are thoroughbreds and old gray mares. Similarly, some humans are beautiful and educated and others are dull and homely. Such some are rich and some are poor. In nature, we find fertile land and sterile land, lush forests and useless deserts, invaluable gems and colored stones. We find happiness and distress, love and hate, victory and defeat, war and peace, life and death, and so on. However, we do not have any permanent relationship with any of these conditions. Because we are eternal spirit souls, parts and parcels of Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vedic culture is arranged in such a way that everyone can become perfect in self-realization simply by performing his occupational duty for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Swe swe karma abhirat sam siddhim labhite naram. Some conditioned souls, however, believe that complete perfection in life may be achieved by performing ordinary non-spiritual duties on behalf of family, nation, humanity, and so on. Others are interested in neither service to God nor noble mundane activities, and there are others who are actively pursuing sinful life. Such persons generally risk Ra, rise from bed late in the afternoon, stay awake all night, taking intoxications and engaging in illicit sex. Such a dark, hellish existence is caused by attraction to the tamagum, the mode of ignorance. So here it goes on to say that it's describing consciousness and activities and elements within the different modes of material nature. So people judge things by what is materially good and materially not good. What did, how do devotees see things good and bad in terms of the material energy? Or in just in general, what is beneficial for my advancement in Krishna consciousness and what is not? So Rupa, Siddha Sanatana Goswami says, Anakulena Krishna, Anakulena, Anakulena and Pratikul. What is favorable for my devotional service, I accept. What is unfavorable, I reject. So that's, that's a big stub subject. How do we get into that? How do we understand what is favorable? And how does what we have some general principles that we live by. But the day-to-day -day life, even the small little interchanges between us and the material energy or between us and other living entities, require that consciousness of seeing what is favorable and what is not favorable. And that's where the real test is, to apply that principle in, in, in all activities of life. So there's where the guidance of the spiritual master goes on. But here, it also explains that there are two kinds of people in household life. 
There's, there's, there's the two kinds of pious householders, actually. Those who perform pious activities in order to somehow or other reap the benefits of material goodness in this material world. To have a nice family, to have a nice relationship with husband and wife, to have a nice home, to have a good bank balance, to have, you know, wonderful children who are successful in material life. We hear that all the time, <laughs> right? Especially, you know, if my child is not successful. I remember I was in London and I was being driven around from one place to another and we were talking about how people come before the deities and pray, my dear Lord, you know, this is my situation. Can you help me and I'll give some donation. So one story was related to me. One lady, she went before the Didi of Sisi Radha, Gokula Nanda, Sitaram, Lakshman, Hanuman, and Gornitai in London. And she was praying, my dear Lord, my child has 10 subjects in school. Please get, let him get all A's. So the result was the boy got nine A's, not 10. The lady was distressed. <laughs> she went back, she said, my dear Lord, I prayed for 10 A's and you only gave him nine. <laughs> you didn't really hear my prayer. You must have been diverted at one time during my prayer, but <laughs> please don't do it again. Anyway, <laughs> the point is that she was so determined to get her prayer answered. Why? Because obviously she wants her son to have the best. But So she's approaching the Supreme Personality. So people approach the Lord and offer puja, worship, and even some seva. Why? To further their material happiness or success in life. That is not bhakti. That is karma yoga at best. Bhakti yoga really means to actually serve the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord. So though there's another class of householders who, gave, who engage all their household paraphernalia and whatever else they have in life for the service of the Lord. So they live a pious life and they follow all the rules and regulations of proper grihasta life. But their goal ultimately is to make their family Krishna conscious, make themselves Krishna conscious. So you see there's two kinds. One who approaches, both approaching the Lord, but one is approaching for better material situations and one is approaching the Lord to become Krishna conscious through that ashram of Grihastha life. But both are, one is, both are considered pious. That is the actual description given to both of them. But well, one still remains within the material world. And the danger within the material consciousness is that even though I'm worshiping the Lord, still, if I don't come to the platform of worshiping the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord, ayabila sita sunya jnana karma anavritam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttamam Srila Rupa Goswami gives the formula how one should direct one's activities in, in spiritual life. One should, one should perform the activities for the pleasure of the Lord with the desire for the Lord and for the pleasure of the Lord. There are those who perform things for the Lord but not for the pleasure of the Lord. Plead the Lord is not given pleasure when one approaches the Lord for something material. And then Krishna looks towards his material energy and if that person is fortunate according to their own understanding, then the Lord will use the material energy to satisfy that person. But they don't get bhakti, <laughs> nor do they get elevation either. They simply get what they ask for, material happiness, or some form of material happiness. But actually here, it mentions in this verse, in the purport actually, there's a statement, I was reminded by Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, where he says, I can't remember the actual Bengali, maybe someone will remember, Advaita, Advaita, Bhadra, Sakale, Samana, A, Manda, A, Brahma, A, 
He says, some people say this is good and some people say this is bad. As far as I understand it, this is all bad. Why? Because anything in the material world is of the nature of duality. And duality means if you accept one side, you get the other side. <laughs> if, you're looking, if one is looking for material happiness, that means you're trying to have a coin with one side. <laughs> Coins have two sides, <laughs> heads and tails. If you see a coin with two sides it heads, you know it's a fake coin. But if you, s the actual understanding is that when we accept material happiness or look for material happiness, the stress is actually coming along automatically. You can't avoid that. That's just the nature of this material world. It's absolute in the sense that the, the duality is absolute. <laughs> it's not absolute in the sense that there's absolute goodness. There's no such thing in the material world. But the absoluteness is that there is absolute duality. <laughs> Uh, and so this, this principle of accepting anything in this material world as good it simply means that one understands its relationship with the source. That's all. Manaso deho geho yo kichu mor arpitu hudaupade nanda kishor. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur gives the formula. Manaso deho geho, my home, my wife, my family, my, my possessions, my very existence. It belongs to you. Why? Because you created it. I just got a letter from someone. They're, they're suffering from some disease. It's a devotee, a very wonderful devotee. Ex wonderful devotee. But her humility is, I don't want to bother the Lord and try to, you know, use my time to try to heal myself because, you know, this is like I'm asking Krishna for some, something. This is, I mean, think about this. She doesn't want to make this great effort, which is necessary in this particular situation, to cure herself because she feels I should use my time just to serve the Lord. So you might think, well, that's quite, you know, deep in spiritual consciousness. But then I wrote back to her that this is not your body. <laughs> you might be in it, but it's not you. You own, you have, you're the, what we say, the resident within the body, but the proprietor is somebody different. As Krishna says in the third, in the um, 14th, no, I'm sorry, 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and there's the, the proprietor, and then and there's the one who is trying to be the enjoyer, Shetra, Shetra, Gya, and then the field of enjoyment, this material body. So I was explaining, no, this is Krishna's body, and you have to take care of it. It's your duty, and that is your service to the Lord to take care of it. And I explained, you know, how Srila Prabhupada emphasizes that principle that devotees really do what is necessary to maintain good health. He said, our philosophy is maintain good health and work hard for Krishna. <laughs> so this idea that it's my body, again, we take the principle all the way to its ultimate understanding of corrected. Everything belongs to Krishna. Nothing, nothing belongs to us. The only thing that belongs to us is the opportunity for devotional service. That's why in the Shastras it said there's only two things in this world. God in the form of the holy name and the jiva. Everything else is illusion. I mean, think about that one. <laughs> Everything else is illusion. What is that illusion? The illusion is that this material energy is meant simply for one thing, as the element of ingredient for service, that's all. And how we use that material energy to serve the Lord depends on the consciousness we develop in relationship to the process of devotional service. 
So one should elevate themselves. And I hear it explains, it'll go on. This purport is really long. <laughs> There's another two pages to go. Should I read more? Do what do you want to hear? Is that okay? Everybody's still awake? If you're awake, then I'm awake. If you fall asleep, there's danger. In New Vrindavan, when we were there in the old days, you know, I mean, everybody got up at 2 o'clock because we had no japa period. Mangalarti was at 4.30 and then the, the whole uh, morning program was successive. Mangalarti, Tosi Puja, uh, Guru Puja, and then class, and then breakfast, and out to work. If you want to chant Japa, you had to chant before Mangalarti. And you had to go to work after breakfast. <laughs> That's the way it was. So devotees got up quite early, <laughs> 2 o'clock. If you got up at 2, you were considered, you know, you're in there. 2.30, all right, it's acceptable. 3 o'clock, whoa, you're looking bad. <laughs> and if 3.30, signs of blooping, <laughs> strong signs. <laughs> so, this is the way it was. And so sometimes even in classes, and the whole class would fall asleep. And sometimes even the speaker. <laughs> I remember there was one devotee who was giving, he was, he was saying, uh, and Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Pradekshitam Mamme Kamsaranam. <laughs> Raja Hum Tum. <laughs> Didn't miss a word. <laughs> so. Hopefully those days are gone. <laughs> the good old days, but sometimes we say, we're glad they're gone. <laughs> so yeah, so I just wanted to check just a little. Because you know, sometimes classes can be really boring and you just fall asleep. So, it goes on to explain here, and after the devotees explain the different modes of material nature. They go that this material world resembles the, the waves of a constant flowing river. Therefore, what is a curse and what is a favor? Hmm. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, he had refused to let certain pious people come into the kirtan in the house of Sri Thakur. It was only for those devotees who are really on the highest platform of loving devotion. He was very restrictive. But the pious people knew Mahaprabhu and wanted to come in and be part of the kirtan. And so they weren't allowed. So some of them became unhappy and some of them became upset. So one Brahmin who wasn't allowed in, he was sitting on the bank of the Ganga one day and Mahaprabhu passed by. And Mahaprabhu was walking and he said, Oh, Nimai Pandit, you're having those nice programs in your home and you're not letting us pious Brahmins in. Therefore, this is not right. Therefore, I curse you. So he took out his Brahman thread, snapped his thread and said, I curse you to never enjoy material happiness. Mahaprabhu was ecstatic. <laughs> he said, thank you very much. <laughs> so what was he saying? And what was Mahaprabhu responding to? He was thinking, yeah, that's a blessing. <laughs> That's a blessing. So from one perspective, something appears to be a curse. And from another perspective, something appears to be a blessing. We see that in every aspect of life. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. Some people like it. Prabhupada says, you know, if you give pig some nice sandesh, he'll just look at it. <laughs> 
one devotee was telling Prabhupada that, you know, I took the sand dash and I rolled it in some dirt and then I gave it to the pig and then he ate it. You wouldn't eat it before then. <laughs> So one man's food is another man's poison. But if you give pig oh, a nice stool, oh, wonderful. Not the stool from GEV, not that, we're not talking about that. That's, that's even, that's a whole nother program there. That's elevated stuff. <laughs> it's nourishing the papayas. Did you, <laughs> did you see that when you went on? Well, of course, we know there's some process in between. <laughs> but ultimately, that's, as Radhanath Swami was saying, every time you flush the toilet, you're increasing the fragrance of the flowers. Because the process, I don't want to get into this anyway. <laughs> this is another story. But anyway, this is, this is ingenuity in its highest form of understanding how to use the material energy. <laughs> they tried in the, in the secular society, but they don't come up with the same results. There's no fat papayas. <laughs> so, so the point is, what is a curse and what is favorable? What are the heavenly planets and what are the hellish planets? What is actually happiness and what is actually distress? One man, one person might enjoy killing, another person will just, the thought of killing becomes a form of unhappiness. <laughs> So this is the nature of this world. Because the waves flow constantly, none of them have an eternal effect. So happiness and distress are all temporary. The argument may be given that since in the Vedas there are prescribed and forbidding activities, the Vedas also accept the concept of good and evil within the material world. So the Vedas are giving. There are things that are good and considered evil. The fact is, however, that it is not the Vedas themselves, but the conditioned souls who are bound up in material duality. The function of Vedic literature is to engage each individual in a particular level by which that person can pre is presently situated, which will gradually elevate that person to the perfection of life. So using various types of rules, regulations, and activities, a person is elevated from the mode of ignorance to the mode of passion, from the mode of passion to the mode of goodness, but don't stop there. Sometimes devotees get stuck there. They get stuck in the mode of goodness. And that, what does that mean? That, you know, it's not, you know, I go, I, you know, I chant when I can. <laughs> and I also see the deity when I can. And I'm also a nice person. I give in charity and, and so many things. You know, I'm, you know, sometimes people would come to Krishna consciousness and say, boy, I was such a nice person when I came to Krishna consciousness. Now look at me. <laughs> I'm changed. Well, keep st staying in the process. It's not over yet. <laughs> But the point is that the material mode of goodness is not, it can be a stopgap. And we see those in the higher realms, the demigods and others, um, see that this is the success. And therefore, although they engage in devotional service, they still have a tendency to want to enjoy and load it over the material energy. Therefore, they're called devas. Prabhupada said something very frightening. When I hear this, I heard it at least two or three times from devotees in classes, Prabhupada said, many, he didn't say most, he said many of my disciples will achieve swarga loka. I said, oh, my God, that's horrible. What is Prabodhananda Saraswati say? Akash Pushpayate. That the happiness of material, hap uh, you know, elevated to the heavenly planets, I mean, it's, it's described as being, you know, everything that you're looking for in this level, on material level, is, ex, you know, accelerated to its extent of so much enjoyment. Prabhupada says, you know, you know, I don't know if I should say this, I won't. 
Prabhupada explains that, you know, the longevity of life, the enjoyment that one gets, happiness between male and female, it's all accelerated in the higher planets, beyond one's conception. But what is Prabodhananda Saraswati said? Akash Pushpayate. It's another form of illusion. Why? Because it's still based on the body. It's still based on the material world. It's still not based on the reality of one's existence as a pure spiritual being. And it cannot give happiness. It's not Brahma Sokyam. It's, and Prabhupada's discussing this point with his devotees. And in one quite lengthy discussion, Prabhupada's talking about material happiness. And he's saying there's no material happiness. None. And then one devotee says, but Prabhupada, you know, Prabhupada got challenged so many times. <laughs> but Prabhupada, what about the mode of goodness? We understand from Shastra that the mode of goodness, there is happiness. Prabhupada said, the mode of goodness means knowledge. And that knowledge tells you there's no happiness. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's response. So he's giving us the understanding that really the element of the mode of goodness is, hi is higher knowledge which teaches us that to continue on developing these qualities but use them in the service of the Lord. Without, see it's important to understand that these qualities that are of the nature of the mode of goodness such as humility, tolerance, patience, pridelessness, generosity, not disturbed by happiness and distress, all the quality, the 26 qualities that are mentioned of a Vaishnava, unless that is used in the service, uh, unless that is developed and then used in the service of the Lord, one still was, remains in the mode of goodness or maybe even in, still tinged by even the mode of passion. What does that mean? That means that the process of bhakti begins with sambandha. Sambandha means relationships. So what is my relationship with Krishna? What is my relationship with this material energy? What is my relationship with other living entities? What is my relationship with guru? So many different aspects of relationship is called sambandha. That knowledge is the foundation for practice of devotional service. But without the qualities, that sambandha doesn't really manifest. Therefore, abhideya, the process is not really executed correctly or properly until those qualities. And you see, Radhana, if you listen to Radhana Swami's lectures really carefully, he's always emphasizing the qualities of a Vaishnava all the time. In anything, he was talking about how, you know, Krishna was trying to be attracted by Duryodhana with nice, beautiful arrangements for a big banquet and so many nice dancers and dramatic actors and so many things, just so Krishna would come to this program. But there was no bhakti. There was motivation to be, to get Krishna's favor so he could continue to exploit the Pandavas. Krishna could see that. And then, of course, as we hear from the, in the lecture, he went to the house of Vidura. Vidura wasn't even home. And when Dora, he knocked on the door, Dora, Vidura's wife came. She became really like surprised and at the same time kind of disoriented. What do I do? Krishna's here. I'm not, we're, not, we're not ready for him. Let me give him something. So she went and found a banana, but in her nervousness, I mean, sometimes that happens. <laughs> and she becomes so excited that she just didn't know which hand the banana was in and the other one, which one the peel was in. So she gave the peel and threw away the banana. <laughs> I think she knew what the difference, but, <laughs> but somehow she just took the wrong hand. <laughs> And she gave, and Krishna was thinking, oh, beautiful offering. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> so we hear over and over again, what is, what is favorable to Krishna consciousness is love or bhakti, the desire to please the Lord. 
So that, that comes with developing the qualities of a Vaishnava. So the 26 qualities of a Vaishnava are the foundation for the practice of a bhakti, which leads, which completes the principle of Sambandha. And when Sambandha is, is understood, then Abhideya, or the process, actually works. But if Sambandha is not really understood and it's proper, and it's fortified by these qualities, then those qual those anything less makes the process difficult. That's why sometimes devotees have struggle when, with, because they haven't established relationships. That is the whole process of how, what is the quality of that relationship? Is it based on personal interest, exploitation, or just the wrong understanding? Or is it based on facilitating devotion and whatever is needed for devotional service. And that, that's the principle that of anything that we do in connection with any object outside of ourself. And then of course that leads to Ryojana, which is the goal, which is love of God. So this is here, this is explained that one can get stuck. And this is it goes on to explain here that here, that is an example. If a man desires to travel from New York to London, the New York airport is certainly the most favorable place from which to travel. But if a man misses his plane, he is no closer to London than anyone in New York who did not go to the airport. In other words, the advantage of the airport is meaningful only if one catches the plane. Similarly, the material mode of goodness is most favorable situation from which to move up to the spiritual platform. The Vedas prescribe and forbid various activities to lift the conditioned soul to the material mode of goodness. And from that point, one should rise to the spiritual pl platform by transcendental knowledge. So here, even in being in the right position, but without the right consciousness, it doesn't go. So, so people get stuck in the mode of goodness. This purport goes on and on for another page and a half. So I'll stop there. Any questions or comments? Um, yes, Mataji. People to come become Krishna consciousness by our efforts. And we reach out. But sometimes it just doesn't happen or you know it's almost sometimes throwing ghee on ashes and doesn't nothing comes but still the effort if his effort is made in the mood of trying to please the Lord and to elevate others to Krishna consciousness that is success if we're looking for some personal gain then that's then it's tinged by karma yoga. It's, if we're looking for some gain at all, it's still bhakti, but in a sense that it is not we are, it's not the highest form of bhakti. I want I want to do it as nice as I can for Krishna's pleasure. If it doesn't come out nice, then I'm not happy, or I feel like I somehow or other I failed. You know, Prabhupada was asked the question, how do you know if Krishna is pleased when, by what you do? Prabhupada says, you become pleased. <laughs> you can experience that in the activity you offer. So when Krishna is pleased, then as because we are part and parcel of Krishna, we're never disconnected from Krishna. Although we don't always experience that connection, still when Krishna is pleased, the, by the activities of devotional service, the devotee becomes happy, becomes peaceful, one becomes satisfied. That's an experience. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Loka. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Um, sort of feeling my way through this question, but as you were speaking, you're speaking about service that really isn't about our own personal gain and we found ourselves last night having a bit of a conversation about American politics which is a little troubling 
for us in the United States. And yet when I think about things like American politics or, or any of the conditions that we see out in the world and sometimes conversations about social justice, it seems as though that can be a trap because any work done in that direction is really only temporary and illusory as well, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's done from an intent or a conversation about it to see that there's, to, to, to try to help that situation, but even though it might not be for my personal gain, I might be thinking about it in terms of the gain overall to a community or a society. It doesn't seem, as I listen to your classes, though that it really has a focus, a purpose of pleasing the Lord. It's not really the kind of devotional service that help us, helps us advance. So I'm just curious about your insights, because these things are around I mean, us and we know take, this. Take a look at the world today. You can say it's pretty difficult times around the world. Just to use a small word, difficult. How, 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 many, how, how, how often do people in the material world try to make a better situation? Every people are always trying, but still it's difficult. What does it mean? It means you can't do it. <laughs> you can't adjust material energy to work in such a way. You can follow certain principles that are what we say characteristics of what we say proper behavior and etiquette. That, that's there, that's called you know, modern civility, how to behave and how not to behave. You know, proper etiquette, you know, politeness, concern, philanthropy, all these things. But the United Nations was started simply to bring people together in a, a more world unity to bring about peace in the world. So they tried that, and that was a noble attempt. But look what it is, it's still a mess. It just doesn't, you can't adjust the material energy to make it work. You know, some adjustment is there, and then as, the, as time goes on, the modes are always competing for each other. So the mode of passion is competing with the mode of ignorance, mode of goodness competing. Compete. So it's always changing. So in a day-to-day -day life, we live basically on the principles of proper behavior and what is good and what is not good for advancement in, in life. In other words, be a nice person. <laughs> be a, you know, the general qualities of the mode of goodness. But still, as anything in this material world is temporary, and therefore whatever is established will be destroyed again. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make permanent or a more lasting effect, then people have to come to Krishna consciousness because everything material is external to one's existence and therefore cannot give real satisfaction and happiness. It's not that we don't give in charity, or we don't, you know, be concerned about people's suffering. It says even a great soul, when they see people suffering in the material world, they feel unhappy. But then we have to understand what is the solution. The solution is not more material adjustments. It's, it's just, it just, the more you adjust, the more you adjust. <laughs> adjustment leads to more adjustments. As Prahlad Maharaj explains, what is that statement? What does he say? Um, if you want to become happy in this material world, do one thing, don't try for happiness. Yeah, that's Pallad Maharaj. Why? Because he says that everything, any material solution to a material problem is more pro problematic than this problem. It just leads to another problem. And it's obvious, you can see it. And the world is just going on like that. So for devotees, we feel unhappy because of the situation, but at the same time we know the solution is not material adjustments. It's Krishna consciousness. When people become Krishna consciousness, then they can understand their own welfare. As Prahlad Maharaj mentions in the fifth canto, he's praying for everyone to become peaceful. He says, let there be peace in the world. 
sounds like a, an almost like a political statement. He says, let there be peace in the world. But he said, then he ends the prayer, they only can be peaceful when they understand their real self-interest, which is their relationship with Krishna. Then they can be peaceful. <laughs> So that's the, that is what is needed the most. Does that help a little? Yeah, yes, and um, just as a follow-up follow -up thought, we can notice these circumstances or these situations and use them to help us refocus our attention on Krishna consciousness, consciousness and on our sadhana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can use these to understand that we can become an instrument for God's mercy towards others as we become spiritually stronger. So if you want to make a difference in helping people, you, the stronger you are, the more you can influence others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Yes, Prabhu. Thank you, Marge, for a wonderful class. We understand when the soul travels from one body to another, he's accompanied by the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. Did you mention that when the soul enters a rock, aren't those subtle, isn't the subtle body? Um, I mentioned that some elements of the material energy don't have subtle bodies. Just like Prabhupada said, there's certain rocks that have consciousness and certain rocks that don't. <laughs> That's a lecture he mentions. And then he says, in where is it? In Kashmir, he said there's one rock that gets bigger every year. He was saying in one lecture. You can go and see it. The rock is actually growing. <laughs> It's not a shallogram either, <laughs> or anything. So, using, you know, some material energy is jetta. It's dead. It's just you know, when it's made. But when it ha when there is a living being in there, then the subtle body is also present. Mm -hmm. Is that? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just like this was once a tree, so that tree also ha has a subtle body because there's a soul in there. But now that tree is no longer, this piece of wood now has been made into something different. So it's been separated from its existence and now it's just dead matter. Mm -hmm. But because it's used in the service of the Lord, it's spiritual. That's just an example. Okay. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.